seven. Um, so this is a search session. Search session. I wanted to remind you all to join the relevant Slack channel. Um, I think it's called FRB 2021 Plenary 07. Um, feel free to hop on there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to chair this session tonight. I'm Sarah Brooks Belower. Good to see you all and meet you all if I haven't met you before. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can engage in this, um, this session. You know, you guys have probably done this before in the other sessions here, but I'll just remind you that you're welcome to submit questions to the Q&A. Um, or you, if you, if, um, if the speaker is not live, some of these are recorded um, this evening. Um, if the speaker is not live, you're welcome to submit questions to the Slack channel that then the speaker can answer later. I also encourage anybody during the talk when one of the recorded talks, if somebody is a collaborator on that project, feel free to speak up and say that you are welcome, or you know, you're willing to answer questions. Um, we'd be happy to, happy to take live questions from collaborators on each project. Um, so let me know, please, if that's the case. And with that, I think we'll get started. So this is all about fast radio burst searches. The first talk is going to be by Ziggy Plunas. And the talk will is titled New Repeating Sources of FRBs from Chime FRB. My name is Ziggy. I am a member of the Chime FRB collaboration. I was a postdoc at McGill University, but I'll be moving to the University of Toronto's Dunlap Institute in a month. Uh, I'm currently in the Netherlands, so that's why I pre-recorded this talk as it's 2 a.m. for me right now. Um, I'm, I suspect that some of my colleagues from the Chime FRB collaboration will be online to answer some of your questions. Uh, today I'll uh, present about new repeating sources of fast radio bursts that we're finding in Chime FRB. Um, We've discussed this um, extensively during the meeting, but I think one of the big questions in the field of fast radio bursts is if they all repeat, and if so, if they all repeat periodically. Uh, as we know, no fast radio burst has been directly associated with a cataclysmic event yet, and we do see some differences in terms of the burst morphologies of uh, one-off FRBs and repeater bursts um, that hint at there being maybe two populations of sources. And I've illustrated uh, at the bottom here, the big question that we'd like to, to map out is uh, the population of fast radio bursts as a function of repeat rate. So if there's really two distinct populations of one of FRBs and repeaters, uh, you find um, uh, it will look like the green distribution in the illustration. Uh, but if in, instead all fast radio bursts come from some uh, large continuum of repeat rates, uh, you'd have a lot of rare repeaters in the orange curve, and then you have some prolific repeaters that you find with high repeat rates. So we'd have to map out this repeat rate distribution to learn something about this. And to do that, we have to find more repeating sources and constrain more uh, repetition rates. And so in order to search for repeat bursts, there's multiple strategies. Uh, we do know that there are many more dim bursts from each source than there's bright bursts from the same source. And this was very nicely pointed out uh, in this histogram from a paper by Lee et al, uh, following up FRB 2012 1102A uh, with the FAST telescope. Uh, only a small number of sources have been studied in great detail, so the repetition statistics are largely unconstrained. Uh, they seem to be non-Poisonian and clustered in mo most cases. And so the two strategies are to either revisit or monitor the same sky location. This is uh, something that Chime FRB is doing, uh, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So Chime FRB uh, monitors the northern hemisphere every day above declination of minus 11 and revisits all the same sky position. Um, another strategy would be to follow up detections of fast radio bursts uh, with a more sensitive telescope. So this has been nicely demonstrated uh, by Kumar et al. twice, once by finding repeat bursts from SCAP repeater with the Green Bank telescope and once by finding repeat bursts with the Murray Yang telescope. Um, and uh, likewise, uh, Lua et al. Um, demonstrated this by finding repeat bursts from a, a source that was originally detected by the Murray-Yang telescope using the FAST telescope. Um, Chime FRB has already uh, uncovered the population of repeaters. Here you see the first 18 sources. Each row is one source, and then all the colored circles are detections of the source with Chime FRB. Uh, I provided here the web link to our public web page where we announce new bursts from these sources. And you see here that some sources are very prolific. We see them almost throughout the whole existence of our experiment, 
whereas other sources we see only very occasionally. Some recent highlights from Chimer for B uh, were, first of all, the local universe fast radio burst that Mohit has been talking about in plenary one. Very exciting. And then there's this other source that we've been hearing a lot about uh, during this uh, conference, which is FRB 2020-1124A. So this entered the scene in November of last year. Uh, we've, uh, in this figure that I'm showing here, uh, I'm showing the exposure time of, fast, uh, of Chimer for B over the duration of our experiment and also our relative sensitivity over the duration of our experiment. This, so this just shows that as of uh, July 2018, we have been sensitive to the sky position. We've been observing it almost every day, uh, but still we only first detected a burst in uh, November of 2020. And then the source, as you know, became very active in February and March of this year. Um, we announced this in an ATEL, uh, and many of you have followed up the source since. Um, we've been starting to understand really uh, the characteristics of the source. And Adam Lemon, a postdoc at McGill, is working on writing up the China for redetections of the source. So keep your eyes peeled for that paper. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons from the new repeaters that were found by China for B. I'll just keep this, uh, this slide up in case you want to revisit um, it offline. What we now love to do is uh, do a complete and systematic search of all of the events, all the detections in the China for B database in order to find more repeaters and also report something about the completeness of our repeater search. So the way we do this is by a clustering analysis. Uh, this has been led by Adam Dong at UBC and Alex Josephi at McGill. Um, and basically we look for clusters in sky position and DM uh, from the real time detection metadata that we uh, save in a database for all of our single pulse detections. And we take into account in this clustering uh, the systematic and statistical uncertainties that we are aware of in our search. So the tolerance in this clustering is about 13 dm units, about one degree in declination, and about half a, a degree corrected for the declination in right ascension. And then to illustrate this, I, um, I put this figure here in the top left, which is for galactic sources. So you see RA and DEC on the horizontal and vertical axis, and then it's color coded by dm. So what you see show, shown up here are the clusters identified by the clustering analysis. Uh, and this analysis rediscovered all published time for B repeaters. Uh, it, it is able to rediscover uh, pulsars in the galaxy. It also found some new galactic sources that we announced earlier. Um, and now it provided us with a list of candidate repeater sources that we're uh, investigating in more detail before announcing them as uh, true repeater sources. So one thing we have to do for all of these sources is uh, figure out the best localization. Uh, so we have three different methods that um, you might have come across already in our previous papers. Uh, so the first of them is uh, to fit the per, per beam detection signal to noise uh, with a beam model. This is something we've done, for example, in the first catalog. And this gives us a precision of about 15 arc minutes. This analysis is led by Alex Josephi at McGill. And then there's the fitting the per beam intensity data with a D model. So especially if we, if we save the disk, which we try to do for all the detections, intensity data, not only for the detection beam, but also for all the surrounding beams on the sky and next to the FRB. So this gives you a precision of about a few arc minutes. And this is work led by Paul Schultz at the University of Toronto, and it will be described in detail in a future publication. Uh, finally, our best possible a localization we get when we save the complex voltages to disk upon detection. Uh, we do this for a large fraction of all our detections right now. And basically we can brute force repoint uh, the interferometer uh, to the suspected location of the fast radio burst and then find the best possible localization. Uh, this is described in detail by, in this paper by Daniela Mikili and others. And the analysis for this new repeater sample is led by Cherry Ying at the University of Toronto. And this gives us about sub arc minutes uh, resolution um, of localization. So with these localizations in hand and also with our best estimate of the dispersion measure of each event, uh, what we have to calculate is a chance coincidence probability uh, for these uh, uh, events being close to each other. Um, and it's very important to do this because the probability of detecting two unrelated fast radio bursts at very high declination with similar DM is non-negligible. And this is because the North Celestial Pole is always in our, in our field of view and our exposure really skyrockets towards high declination. 
Uh, so the way we do this is we model FRB detections as a set of independent Bernoulli trials. Uh, you can see the formula for the PCC uh, down there. And then we compare all the candidate repeater sources with the, all the FRB detections in that same time frame uh, to correct for the trials. Um, so graphically, how this looks like, I try to sketch it on the left. We have our complete phase space of dispersion measure and declination in the, in the search. Uh, and then for all the events, we have a best estimate of the DM and uncertainty and best estimate of the declination and uncertainty. So we compare all the events in the suspected clusters with each other. That gives us a chance coincidence probability. Uh, and if, we, um, if it's above some sigma level, we say something is truly a repeater source and we can include it and present it to the world. Uh, and the challenge here is to get that localization precision down as I um, uh, show, sh um, showed on the previous slide and also to get this uh, DM uncertainty down, uh, which is sometimes difficult because we know some uh, repeater bursts show structure. So there's a difference in the signal to noise optimizing DM and the structure optimizing DM, for example. And this uh, framework for chance coincidence probability calculation uh, is set up by Amanda Cook at the University of Toronto, PhD student there. So what I'll present in the rest of this talk today is only those new repeater sources for which we think um, the, uh, we are three sigma sure or more that they are real repeaters and not due to chance. Um, so just to highlight uh, uh, once more this exposure uh, towards the North Celestial Pole point, this is a figure that I took from Pratya Chala's recent paper on population synthesis um, to study the scattering uh, properties of the first catalog. Uh, in blue here, it's shown the exposure. It's not in absolute numbers, uh, but uh, it's normalized, which you see it really goes up uh, towards high declination and beyond this gray dashed line to the right of it, uh, above declination of about 70, we see each sky position twice every day during the podal and the antipodal transit. Um, then in, uh, in orange, you see uh, the sky area that we probe, and then in green, it's the, uh, the combination of the two. So CHIME is located at a latitude of 49 degrees, uh, which means that our sensitivity is highest around 49. And then if you compare the exposure and the sensitivity, there's really a sweet spot for detection of repeaters around the declaration of 70. You see this in the first sample. So these are the first nine repeaters uh, 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 detected by CHIME FRB, um, pointed out by uh, red vertical lines. And you see most of them were around declination of 70. Um, we later announced nine more. So you see, we start to fill in a little bit of the declination space, but there's really a clustering at these high declinations that's um, really only instrumental just because the way the survey is set up. Now, using this clustering analysis and, re sorry, and recent detections, uh, we have uh, two more repeaters that were already published, uh, the repeater towards M81 from Bartwatch et al. And then there's this uh, hyperactive repeater 2020-1124A. And then from the clustering analysis, we find at least 16 more new sources of which we're sure they're real. So that brings us to at least 36 repeaters from Chime and Um, You see, we start filling in even more of the declination space. Uh, interestingly, there's now also a repeater source at a declination of eight. So this is very interesting, especially to uh, because this uh, is in the field view of more of the southern hemisphere telescopes. Uh, so it, uh, it's possible to follow it up, follow the source up with the telescopes as well. Uh, so some characteristics of these new sources. Uh, so we find more sources with downward drifting suppers. Here's two examples uh, of downward drifting suppers in two different uh, sources. Uh, then top right, we see a source of rel relatively broadband emission. So we're pretty sure this is a repeater source as well. Um, and it further highlights that, that, that the morphologies of these bursts are drawn from some continuum of properties. Um, and al already, I think, in one of the bursts from the repeater towards M81, we also see this kind of behavior where the bursts are much um, uh, shorter in time and broader already in frequency than, than we typically see in repeaters. Uh, I pointed out the source at a declination of about 80, 8 degrees. 
uh, we see of order 10 burst and um, uh, we only see the sky position for a few minutes every day. So it makes the burst rate quite high and this will be an interesting target for follow-up observations. And then finally, one other highlight is that we find one repeater uh, at a DM of 1730 DM units and towards the sky position, the, the galactic contribution is really modest. It's less than 100 DM units. So this shows that uh, there's really also repeaters out at, uh, at larger distances. Uh, so if you look at the detection rate versus time, it looks roughly like this. Number of repeater sources on the vertical axis and then time on the horizontal axis. Ideally, I'd like to show this as a function of exposure, uh, but calculating the exposure and the sensitivity for this well, duration is still work in progress. So that's uh, something um, I'll show later. Uh, you see here in dark gray, it's the period of the first sample of eight repeating sources. In light gray, that's the period of the um, sample of nine more repeating sources. And then with the gray dashed lines, I've uh, uh, indicated when we detected the most prolific repeating sources. So R2, or 3 uh, repeater towards M81, and then uh, 2020, 11, 24, A. So in this last uh, period up to May of this year, uh, that's uh, up to when we perform the clustering analysis, additional candidate repeaters are subject to internal scrutiny. So the number of detections here might grow. Also not uh, indicated in this uh, figure are periods of downtime when either due to heat in British Columbia or uh, due to other uh, issues we were down for, for longer periods of time. Uh, but the point is that there's a steady increase in the detection of repeater sources. Um, interesting would also be to compare this with the total number of one-off FRBs detected, but this number is also not um, available at this time. We also need to vet all the one-off FRBs. Um, I also just like to highlight another uh, follow-up project I'm involved with, which is to uh, try to detect time FRB repeaters with low far. Uh, this is ongoing. Uh, here's all our observations from uh, the last semester. All the gray circles here are detections with Chime FRB. Uh, our strategy is to try to point low fire to those sky position as soon after a detection with Chime FRB as possible. Uh, you see this resulted in one new detections of the source 2019-02-12A. Um, some other sources we observed but didn't detect any additional low fire burst. And interestingly, in a big monitoring campaign of R3, uh, we only detect two more bursts, even though we have um, we observe the source very often in and out of its activity phase. And uh, I encourage you to go check out Akshata Gopinath's lightning talk on this low form monitoring of R3. We observed R49, which is an, one of those unpublished new repeater sources from China for uh, but no detection yet. This is ongoing work. Um, with the China for collaboration together with uh, colleagues at Ostrom and UVA in the Netherlands. So just to wrap up, I've talked about new repeating sources of fast radio bursts, how we are doing a complete and systematic search of our database. Uh, work is underway to vet all candidate sources uh, from this search. This will roughly double the number of known repeating sources. Um, and our detection rate seems steady, uh, though we will need to consider exposure, sensitivity, and configuration changes. Uh, so don't overinterpret the figures I, I showed today. Like, this is uh, one of our uh, highest priorities after getting the first catalog out. And I also um, like to point out that active sources can still suddenly turn on, even though you don't see any emission from a certain sky position. And a good example of this is FRB 2020 1124A. So we should keep looking for more hyperactive repeaters. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, Looks like there is a question in the q and I'm going to read it out, and I want to uh, hopefully some, somebody from Chime can answer this. Um, so Clancy James says, question for Ziggy, is there evidence that the DMs for the newly discovered repeaters are higher than, previously, than previous repeaters, that is, probing deeper into the universe as time goes on, or is it that repetition behavior is sufficiently bursty that this is unimportant? Is anybody available to answer that? Maybe put your hand up. I can say something very briefly, which is that uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think that we see this, um, but uh, I would I would pose it in the Slack channel for Ziggy specifically. 
Yeah, I'll copy that question over. All right. Are there any other questions that people want to ask live? Oh, there's another one coming in. Um, Adam Deller says that was baseband data acquired for the broadband repeater? And what is uh, the temporal width and polarization properties of that source? All right, sounds like there might not be somebody here who can answer that. Um, so I will post the remaining questions into the Slack channel, hopefully for Ziggy to answer later. Um, I see yours in the chat too, Matthew, thanks for that. Um, so just a reminder, if you want to submit questions for uh, speakers to answer later, feel free that, to do that in the Slack. Um, there's the um, FRB you know, 2021 plenary 07 session um, on the channel on the Slack that you can log on to. All right, so next up is another recorded talk by, oop, I lost my page here. There we are, by Fabian Jankowski. And it's going to be on a sample of localized fast radio bursts discovered by mirror trap. Hello everyone. My name is Fabian Jankowski and I'm a postdoc in the mirror trap group at the University of Manchester. Today I will present you an initial sample of reasonably well-localized fast radio burst discovered by the MIRTRAP team with a MIRCA telescope. This is roughly the progress from the last year of observations. This is the first MIRTRAP related talk in this meeting and so I will quickly introduce the project. Um, MIRTRAP is a fully commensal project at the MIRCA telescope array that consists of 64 antennas of approximately 13.9 meters in diameter. We focus on real-time data processing and transient detection. That means in particular that only candidate snippets and metadata are saved, so not the full raw data. We piggyback on all, all large-scale uh, survey projects that are running at the telescope. Um, that means we have a huge amount of time on sky and a large sky coverage, about 20,000 hours over five years uh, of the runtime of the project. Meerkat is a state-of-the-art telescope and has excellent sensitivity, as you have seen in other talks already. I give the performance numbers uh, for L-band on the slide. As part of Meerkat, we perform basically two surveys in one. One with the incoherent beam that has a relatively wide field of view of about 1.1 square degrees, and it has about uh, the sensitivity of parks. The second survey is with the coherent beams, um, it has a, small, a bit smaller field of view, but it has about GBT sensitivity. The majority of observations so far have been conducted at L-band, with only a small fraction at UHF, and the S-band system is in preparation. Um, we are currently testing uh, VO event-based real-time FRB trigger, uh, triggering. That means we will soon have uh, voltage buffer da uh, data available the results that I present you today are only possible because of the huge amount of work by many people. The MIRTRAP collaboration consists of people from five different uh, institutions and it led, uh, is led by Ben Steppers at the University of Manchester. External collaborators are the Thundercat team and the F to the 4 team. Now to the survey that we have performed so far. Here I show you an overview of the MIRTRAP survey coverage in galactic coordinates. We have spent about equal amounts of time at low and high galactic uh, latitudes, that means uh, on the galactic plane and off the galactic plane, and the average observing time per day is about eight hours. Um, the survey so far is heavily biased towards observations at L-band, with only about 10% spent at UHF and less than 1% at S-band. In this slide, I marked a couple of uh, fields with high exposure, such as the double pulsar, um, and the brightest and closest millisecond pulsars, J0437 minus 4715. Other example fields are uh, some well studied fields in the X ray or optical bands, such as the Chandra Deep Field South or the XMM Newton uh, large scale structure field or the Cosmos field. And now to the results.
This is the slide that I showed at the FRB 2020 meeting last year, where we announced our first FRB discovery. However, lots of things have happened over the last year, and we have been quite busy, to say the least. I am very happy to present you an initial sample of Mirtrop FRBs. Here I show a rogues gallery of the D dispersed dynamic spectra, pulse profiles, and spectra on the right hand side. These will appear in publications by multiple members of the Mirtrop team very soon. Additionally, we have discovered many new galactic sources that are currently being timed for those sources for which we have a sufficient number of pulses already. And uh, Tian is currently working on the first sample of galactic sources as part of his PhD. And his paper should be uh, finished soon. Now I will focus on these four FRBs first and will introduce their basic properties. They were all discovered in single coherent beams. Here you can see again their are dispersed uh, dynamic spectra, pulse profiles, and power spectral densities or flux density spectra. Um, these are the burst properties that I show in the table. They have DMs between 140 and 1,200 units and excess DMs between 80 and 1,100 units. By excess DM, I mean the DM above the galactic and the Milky Way halo contributions. They have birth, burst width between 2.4 and 22 milliseconds. Their inferred peak flux density is ranged between 40 and 170 millijansky and they have inferred fluences between 0.8 and 1.5 Jansky milliseconds. Given their excess DMs and assuming a distribution of host DM contributions, we infer redshifts between 0.1 and 1.2 for them. Some of the MIRTRAP FRBs show clear scattering tails in their profiles that allow us to measure their scattering time scales. However, for most FRBs, we are limited by intra-channel dispersive smearing at the low frequency band edge. That is because for most bursts, we only have 1,024 channels across the band. Fortunately, this limitation will be removed once the real-time voltage buffer dump capability is fully deployed. Additionally, uh, fitting the very lowest signal-to-noise FRBs is relatively challenging. Um, so this is why it's still work in progress. The next topic that I want to talk about is the localization of the FRBs and uh, any multi-frequency data. As I mentioned before, these four FRBs were discovered in single coherent beams, which means that they are localized to about one square arc minute uh, or a bit below. The, the coherent beam footprints are actually smaller than uh, one square arc minute for, for three of them. In addition, we are currently trying to improve the localization further by incorporating information about their spectra, such as their spectral indices, into the localization software. On the slide, I show the footprints of the detection coherent beams um, and the localization regions from the non-detections in the other coherent beams. Uh, so the detection beam is in red, the localization region is uh, in green. For three of them, there is extant PANSTARS optical data uh, available, and for the fourth one, there is uh, SkyMapper optical data. And um, as you can see, there are multiple galaxies uh, visible in the localization regions. Um, we are planning to perform path analysis together with the F2 to the 4 team to investigate whether any likely host galaxies can be identified for these FRBs. Now I will talk about another FRB discovered in a single coherent beam, which is similarly localized to better than one square arc minute. It has a DM of about 434 units and an excess DM of about 240 units. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see the tiling pattern of the coherent beams on the sky with the best fitting localization region overlaid. Uh, on the top left-hand side, you can see again a dispersed dynamic spectrum and a pulse profile in which you can clearly see a scattering tail and the spectrum again. On the right hand side, you can see a Gemini South R band image provided by the F2 the 4 team um, with the local, localization region of the FRB overlaid. The F2 the 4 team have performed a path analysis and two galaxies were 
identified as potential host galaxies. Um, the path probability for the larger extent galaxy is about 98% and only about 2% for the smaller galaxy. So it is pretty clear which is the most likely uh, host galaxy for, for this burst. That said, there could be further galaxies hidden before, uh, behind foreground stars. So, uh, and the path analysis try to incorporate that information. Um, and further, there are spectroscopic follow-up ongoing to basically work out the redshift of the larger extent galaxy. Again, this is uh, done by the F2-4 team. In the same FRB that I just talked about, we might see something that looks like a faint post-cursor pulse. I show it in the pulse profile here, marked by the red arrow, and you can also see it faintly in the DM trial um, versus time plot here. Um, it seems to occur about 200 milliseconds after the main burst component, and apparently has the same DM as you, as you can see as you can see here. So. It, if the pulse is indeed genuine, it might indicate that this is a repeating FRB source. Alternatively, it could also be a subburst component from a wider burst envelope that peaks out from the baseline noise. So in any case, this could be an interesting FRB source. And aside from that FRB, um, we have seen no uh, repeat pulses for, for um, any of these sources in 3 to 27 hours on the fields with Meerkat. Uh, that said, we are currently performing a double check of the candidate des database. So how does the initial MIRTRAP FRB sample fit into the known FRB population? This is what I uh, show on this slide here. Um, I compare the basic observational properties, such as the observed DMs and pulse width um, of the MIRTRAP FRBs with those from the literature that I took from the transient name server and that are augmented slightly. Um, and when looking at the observed DM distribution, um, you can see that the MIRTRAP distribution is, looks initially quite similar to the Atmos distribution and to some extent also the Parks distribution. And for the pulse width, the same is true as well. Um, there are some, at least some similarities between these uh, distributions. And so, so what does this mean? Um, obviously, we're still very much in the low number statistics regime, and so I caution to interpret too much into it. However, it could perhaps mean that the observational biases or selection functions of the MIRTRAP survey um, is similar to the Atmos survey uh, and to some extent also the PARC survey, uh, meaning also there are similar exposure properties maybe. Um, what you also see here is an apparent lack of high DM bursts, so very high DM bursts above 2000 units for example, um, even though we search up to 4,000 DM units or and even higher than that. Um, this could be because of observational biases in the machine learning classifier, that the machine learning classifier is actually biased against these bursts. And we think that because we have actually um, very good sensitivity to low, low DM bursts, um, because we have um, a, a sizable number of galactic uh, discoveries. Um, so we are we will probably reprocess all the candidates with a new and improved classifier. When looking at the fluence distribution, however, you see that the mere trap distribution is shifted to lower fluences. Um, it is roughly located at the low end of the parks distribution, as you can see here. Um, and that is expected because of the higher sensitivity of the mere trap survey in comparison with Atmos and parks and also uh, ASCAP. Uh, note that I only show the four, I show the distribution for the four single coherent beam FRBs here. Um, some of the other FRBs have higher fluences, so that would fill in some of the distribution, but um, they have not been estimated carefully yet. This is why I only show the four here. So this is already my summary slide. I presented you a first sample of FRBs discovered by the MIRTRAP team that are well localized. I discussed their burst properties, their better than one square arc minute localizations. I showed extant optical data and the most likely host galaxy for one of the bursts. I commented on limits on their repeatability and the possible discovery of a repeat pulse in the data. 
Finally, I showed how the Mirtrap sample fits into the known FRB population. And as I mentioned before, we have multiple publications coming, so stay tuned for them. And I would also like to advertise Laura's talk in the pinpointing session where she talks about her first arc second localization. We also got a late breaking news talk on Thursday, so stay tuned for that. And feel free to ask questions either here or in the Slack channel. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Fabian. Um, so is there anybody here who can answer questions for this talk? If so raise your hand now. All right, great. Um, so the question in the Q in the Q and A that says, why do you show lower limits for fluence of these bursts? I'm from Walid Majid. Oh, let's see. I need to allow you to talk. All right, Laura, you should be able to speak now. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. I can't answer that one, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I wasn't uh, part of that uh, part of the analysis. So I'm not sure. Definitely send it to the Slack and I'm sure Fabian or someone then might answer it when they wake up. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'll transfer it over. All right, thank you. Um, Ryan Shannon asks, what is the beam spacing of the coherent beams? Um, so we put them, we initially put them really close together and kind of overlapping. I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure the exact um, number now, but we, we put them at a percentage sensitivity overlap. Um, and I think, don't quote me on this, it might be 60% at the moment um, because we decided we wanted a bit more coverage um, to, to get a few more in the coherent beams. Um, but don't quote me on that number. All right. Thank you. All right. Are there other questions um, for Fabian or Laura? Oh, um, another one from Ryan Shannon says, uh, do you detect the FRBs in multiple coherent beams? Yes, sometimes we do. Um, so it, it, of course, depends on how bright the FRB or um, galactic source is. Um, and that means that we can use the tidal ray beam localization method, um, so which I'll talk about a little bit in my talk. So yes, depending on the properties of the FRB and where exactly it is, but yes, sometimes we do. I'm not sure exactly which FRBs um, that Fabian talked about. Uh, I think those ones were all only in one coherent beam as far as I know, but yes, we do. Oh, um, Ronnie Kurz, you have your hand up, but I also noticed you just submitted a question that says lower limits are only in, or if only in one beam, and oh, I can't quite understand what you typed there, but maybe you could uh, speak up. Uh, okay, if you only see it in one beam, uh, you don't know where it is in the beam, and so you can't correct for the beam attenuation. Uh, I'm guessing that's because that's what always happens when you only detect things in one beam with any telescope. Yeah, that would make that would make the most sense for this. All right, thank you, Ron. All right, to keep us on track, maybe I'll move on to the next talk. Um, so the next one's by Yuri Van Leeuwen, and it's about fast radio burst detections and discoveries with apertif. And this is a, again a recorded talk. Hi everyone, I'm Yuri Van Leeuwen. You're seeing this recording, which means uh, the internet at my current place uh, isn't uh, fast enough for uh, this session. But still, I'm uh, proud to present to you today some of the latest results from the FRB survey that we are carrying out with Apertif. Um, myself and the team will be in Slack though, so if you have any questions, you can post them there and we'll uh, be glad to answer them. So, as uh, you can see on the left here, uh, Apertif is the uh, extension, the phase array feed upgrade to Westerbork that uh, increased the field of view from the old field of about half by half uh, degree on the sky. You can see that in the little dashed circle in the middle to a field of view that's almost 40 times bigger, uh, close to 10 square degrees. And of course, that's uh, important for all kinds of surveys, but especially for fast radio bursts, this has turned out to be a very interesting system. <clears throat> now, of course, only a large group of people can build that, so I want to list those names here. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the technical folks, uh, and on the, in the column on the left, you can see the people behind the work that I'll present today. And there I've tagged the uh, participants uh, 
that are currently in the channel. So please feel to uh, feel free to uh, reach out to these folks. Now, any FRB talk, I just like starting out with this figure because it doesn't happen often that I get to show uh, a plot that it sums it all up for me, on which uh, where on one of the axes there is more than 10 orders of magnitude in it. Huh? Here at the bottom in the ground plane, you can see that in pulse width and in bandwidth, uh, FRBs are very much like pulsars. Of course, in the luminosity scale, we're looking at 10 to the 16 uh, difference in the scale. And so we don't already really understand how pulsars shine. And so this continues to mean for me that, uh, that FRBs are really interesting in trying to figure out what these are powered by. So how does Aperitif go about uh, detecting sources like these? So it's summer now, if you went there, Aperitif's in a forest, Westerbox in a forest. You can see it's an east-west area, yeah, it's all in one big line. There's uh, 12 dishes that you see here, two would be uh, right behind us. And these, these 25 meter dishes each, you know, together they still form one of the most sensitive interferometers in the world. And in 12 of these dishes, we've installed Aperitif, and those are the wide band receivers that increase the field of view by uh, about a factor of 40, like I was saying. And these make it an excellent survey. Now what's neat is that it continues to be an interferometer, and so this also means you can make high resolution beams and you can also make images. To do that though, you need a backend. Our backend is called ARTS, the Aperitif Radio Transient System. It's a completely real-time system that consists of a hybrid supercomputer. When we built it two years ago, it was one of the top 100 in the world. It first has two sets of FPGA-based beam formers that combine the dishes and do the corner turn. And then there's a big GPU cluster right behind it. Uh, we uh, do our RFI excision in real time. Um, and also this GPU cluster uh, uh, powered by the search software called Amber and the deep neural net detection that we perform afterward. It allows us to detect these faster radio bursts in real time. So the data comes in in the uniboards, those you see here. Then uh, there's more internet that goes through these cables than uh, the whole country of the Netherlands uh, needs. So we are one of the biggest data generators in the country. And then in the end, of course, all this data ends up in the in five racks of uh, GPU uh, nodes that form the ARTS uh, GPU, the real heart, the searching heart of the, of the uh, ARTS search point. So how do we survey? Uh, there's three things uh, we want to do in ALERT. We want to detect new sources. We want to then localize them better and we want to try and characterize any known sources and that's how we come up with the priorities for the field of course uh, it's uh, dishes and so you can point as long as you want in which direction you want basically what we do most is uh, try and target uh, fields with known sources uh, especially when these are repeaters or new acrobies we try and localize these sources better and use the better detections if there are sources that are already pretty well localized, we try and hit these more because we can characterize FRBs like that and still get our new detections. And if uh, there's uh, uh, our angles where there aren't many known fields, we target plant fields. And so at the bottom, you can see how we are uh, covering a large part of the northern sky. Our time fraction for 2021 has uh, decreased a little bit. Currently, really we're on sky one week out of every five. We do about three hour pointings and Aperitif will operate until the end of the year. The operations funding for next year is unclear. So it's been going strong so far. We are very glad uh, that uh, two years ago now we found our first FRB, 190709. Um, it was discovered in the first week of the survey itself. And as we've seen, and as we will see in some of these uh, other talks about uh, uh, survey instrument commissioning, it's a big deal to find the first one. So I was very glad. Uh, it's a very standard by now source, a fluence of about maybe seven Jansky milliseconds. So that puts it roughly at the 50th percentile of the known population in brightness. But you know, what's neat about a system like Westerbork is that we get the instantaneous east-west grading response. And you can see that here. <coughs> On the left-hand side, with, colored with rainbows, if you will, you can see the broadband response of the uh, Westerbork array. And clearly, the uh, middle, uh, for this broadband detection, you can clearly say that the middle gradient response is the correct one. And so this produces the ellipse on the right. That's roughly our localization for weak sources, 20 arc seconds by 30 arc minutes or so. 
Uh, and generally, that's good enough to rule out any host, any bright galaxies as the hosts below Z of uh, 0.6, maybe. Um, if they're farther out, of course, we cannot identify it easily. But as you'll see later, these, these localizations are good enough for mapping all the magneto-ionic material along these narrow pencil line of sets. So that was the first one. We've been going steady so far, discovered over 20 new FRDs. Actually, every about five days of observing, we find a new source. And uh, we're very glad because, you know, that makes it one of the most productive Alban servers in the world. We do not only get good rates, we also get interferometric localization, especially in east-west direction. And like I was saying, this is good for mapping material. Um, and so we do think that this, this sample of over 20, of two dozen uh, FRBs now, it marks um, yeah, maybe a new phase in FRB surveying where a growing number of bursts can be used to probe our universe huh? of the SKA. So what are our sources like? They're mostly high DM, up, up to a DM of almost 3,000. Um, these uh, strengths really show some of what these detections really follow from some of our system, system strengths. We have high time resolution, high frequency resolution. We already talked about a couple of days ago in Slack. 80 microsecond sampling at less than 200 kilohertz channels. And this means that you can go out to very high DMs. We, uh, most of the FRBs we find are narrow. We don't see a lot of scattering, but we see some. You can see it here in the overview. There's interesting morphologies. We see scattering, we see scintillation. We see quite a few sources that have more than one component. We actually see a few more multi-component sources than, than you see in the chunk catalog, so that's interesting. Uh, and many of these have polarization. A couple interesting examples, 191108, for example is an FRB that we localized uh, because of its high signal to noise to a much smaller ellipse, uh, five arc seconds by uh, seven arc minutes or so. And this cuts really close to M33 uh, and M31 too. So these are some of our nearest neighbors and you can see that they uh, travel through the uh, circumgalactic medium of uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And so we find that the plasma in these local group galaxies can really only contribute about 10% of the dispersion measure of the source and uh, TDM is about 600. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually add much to the, to the Faraday rotation. Um, it's, it has a Faraday rotation of almost 500 radians per square meter, and that's, that's much too large to be explained by the Milky Way or the um, intergalactic medium. And so this does, again, indicate a very dense local magneto-ionic environment in the source host galaxy. What's interesting and actually unique to this survey is that this uh, time domain survey also included imaging of the field. You can see here... Uh, um, uh, that uh, the imaging part of Aperitif showed that, uh, that we can uh, rule out a persistent radio source like the one that we see in 121102 uh, if it was as close as uh, 191108. And um, no persistent uh, radio uh, sources were found in this uh, survey. So it seems that these sources are good. So that's one-offs. We also, uh, like I said, uh, find repeaters in uh, a number of our fields. One of the results uh, that Liam Ostrom uh, published last year from a 12.1102 is one of the biggest uh, samples of 12.1102 bursts. Um, we find about 30 bursts from this uh, repeater and uh, including two of the brightest that were seen until then. And so we, we find that its, uh, its, its brightness cannot be simply be a power law. And so we need to think again about the underlying emission mechanism there. We also spent a lot of time on R2, um, almost 300 hours, but we didn't detect it. And so this means that those bursts are either very highly clustered or they have a spur. It's very steep. Of course, because we are an east-west array, our instantaneous field of view is elongated in one direction. And so if we want to localize repeaters, we have to find them on different angles. And if we do get two or three bursts from repeating FRBs, we can really shrink the localization by a factor of about 50. There is an example uh, at the bottom from R3. Um, and this is really where some of the long tracks in our uh, detections are a benefit. There's one uh, chime uh, repeater that we have so far localized better than the uh, uh, published value, but that's just still from one burst. And what's interesting is that all these new FRBs that I mentioned earlier, 90% uh, of them are from repeater fields. Now, many people, uh, including myself, have been trying to find FRBs not only with uh, Aperitif, as you can see here, but also with LOFAR. Here in the background, you can already see a combined Aperitif LOFAR image from the imaging side of the view. But of course, we never found one. One of the reasons could be 
that a dense electron missed around the FRB source is uh, blocking the low frequency emission. Um, and so uh, we connected the real-time system and aperitif uh, to LOFAR to see if FRBs shine not only at the higher frequencies, but also in the red. We know we can see the 1.4 gigahertz bursts, but potentially we can also see the 150 megahertz bursts. Uh, we targeted mostly FRB uh, 2018-09-16b, so three. You know, it's, it's the 16-day periodic FRB. Um, from the aperitif side, our real-time detection pipeline automatically dumped the full Stokes data. And so that allowed for polarization calibrated uh, profiles. But based on these triggers, we also looked very hard to see if any simultaneous low far bursts survived. And here you can see at the top is the aperitif burst, at the bottom is the simultaneous low far data. They didn't. But then a few days later, when the aperitif periodicity window was over, the low far burst suddenly arrived. And that was really exciting. Because, uh, and I vividly remember seeing these plots for the first time. And so we detected 1809-16 at both telescopes, but never at the same time. So just looking at the LOFAR data for a sec, it was the first FRB uh, ever seen with LOFAR. It was very exciting. Um, and so it does mean that for this FRB, there's no dense electron mist around the source or in the host galaxy. And you know that's important for uh, cosmological applications because it does allow you to uh, identify better what purely is the extra the bearing If you compare the uh, aperitif data with the low far data, then something interesting shows up. The, you can see it in the plot here on the right. In the green, we have the aperitif data. In the uh, orange, the chime data. And in the red, the low far data. You can see clearly see they're, they're not, uh, cent they're not uh, centered equally. The low frequency burst window is wider and it lags the high frequency uh, burst window. And so for a simple binary wind, you would have expected the opposite. A strong wind, if a strong wind creates the periodic windows, then the 1.4 gigahertz should be wider and not the other way around. And there should be no lag. So that's not it. We do think that magnetar precession is a series of models that can explain the periodicity. But there, of course, some of our data has flat PA. So here it doesn't work so well. Uh, all these have challenges. Uh, synchrotron maser shock models around an ultra long period, isolated magnetar. Um, they have, of course, trouble powering other prolific repeaters, but they sure work best for our data set. Uh, this uh, paper uh, appears in uh, Nature in a few weeks. Now, what's remarkable, as you can see in this plot, with fluence at the bottom and rate on the left, is that uh, 1809-16b actually emits over 10 times more bursts of certain fluence at 150 megahertz than it does at 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, in general, these detections allow us to put the first uh, bounded FRB all sky rate at 150 megahertz, and we find that this rate is between 3 and 450 FRBs per sky per day. So that's really promising also for low frequency uh, surveys in the future. If you look at some of the aperitif data in more detail, we do find a lot of bursts with number of components in time frequency space. Uh, the downward drift uh, you can see here, there's up to 12 components in some of these. Check out the paper or take a look at Anya Bilos' uh, poster number 41 in the Gather Town. And we find a, a sub pulse drift rate of about 40 minus 40 megahertz per milliseconds in aperitif. And so that's that 10 times larger, larger than the value that was seen at 400 megahertz. So to conclude, much of this survey has been carried out in uh, Corona times. And so uh, the original kickoff was uh, one of the last times we actually got together. By now, uh, many of us are behind the screens. I do hope we can uh, make a, a video uh, like this again, uh, including a number of the people that have joined us since, and hope uh, you talk to all of them on Slack. Um, but uh, our conclusions are that that, this, that we, the team, were proud of uh, the achievements so, so far. We detect uh, one FRB every five days of observing. Uh, we've discovered about two dozen uh, one-off FRBs so far with uh, good localization. And the, the combination of those rates with the uh, uh, good localization allows us to see which ionic material lives along these lines of sight, which is important for cosmology. And of course, some uh, part of the results on repeaters are that our aperitif and low for data together uh, will allow that simple, strong binary winds either cause for uh, the periodicity in uh, repeater FRBs. And that's it. Talk to me on Slack. Thanks.
All right. Thanks, Yuri. So it looks like Yuri is actually perhaps live on the Slack channel. So I'm going to post the questions um, asked here to the Slack. Um, unless there's somebody here that can answer them, I uh, raise your hand. If so, I don't see anybody stepping up. All right, so yeah, so there are two questions and I'll post those to the Slack. Thanks, Waleed and Ron for asking those. And otherwise, let's move on to the next talk, which is a live talk um, by Vikram Ravi um, called the Deep Synoptic Array, Commissioning and Early Science. Um, so Vikram will be here live, so feel free to ask questions and we'll have a real question and answer session after this talk. Hi everyone. Thanks, Sarah, can you all hear me okay? I'm assuming yes. Um, yep. Well, hi everyone. Um, good morning, evening, night, wherever you are. And um, thanks for tuning into the session. Um, I will be presenting an update on where we are with the Deep Synoptic Array, which is the, to my knowledge, the one and only telescope uh, specifically designed and built with FRBs as the sole um, motivating purpose. And so, um, this, uh, as you will see, is going to be hopefully the final report on DSA 110 construction. Um, we had one antenna at this time last year, and in just over a week's time, we will, uh, we will begin a six month commissioning period for a 64 element deployment of the DSA. Um, this will include 48 antennas, in an east-west core, as well as our full complement of 16 outrigger antennas. And this system will be able to deliver localizations to better than plus or minus 1.5 arc seconds on the sky. Now, I've quoted a very conservative sensitivity number here as the sensitivity at the half power point of the beam. Um, such that we will be sensitive to roughly 4.2 Jansky millisecond FRBs within a 10 square degree field of view. Um, the full DSA 110, um, all the parts are currently on site. And as we complete a range of projects at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, um, we expect that uh, the full DSA 110 with 110 elements will be completed in early 2022. Um, and before I go on, I also wanted to just, um, just acknowledge how bloody hard this last year has been for, you know, for all of us in our own ways. Um, and from our perspective in particular, I want to really emphasize how grateful I am to the DSA team um, on campus, in their homes, um, at OVRO, our observatory as well, for um, turning up to work, um, spending a lot of uh, the last year working one person per building on site. Um, you'll see some photos a little later on of things people have put together working by themselves day after day, as well as now getting out there in, in the California heat and uh, trenching and trenching and trenching and putting out antennas. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the whole DSA team. So what we actually do is we try and build telescopes with specific purposes in mind to deliver focused experiments. The DSA program was kicked off in 2013 by Greg Hallinan with the idea of building a survey telescope, a deep synoptic array to deliver a range of both time domain and continuum survey science. Um, uh, in 2017, we realized that with just 10 four and a half meter antennas, we could and did localize an FRB to its host galaxy. Uh, the technology we developed for the DSA-10 was also turned upside down, very literally, in that this here is a DSA-10 feed and receiver pointed up to detect um, the, the nearest and brightest FRBs in a project led by Chris Bohanek, a graduate student at Caltech, which um, co-detected the burst from the Magnetar SGR 1935. We are now um, in the midst of the DSA 110 project. Um, this is an NSF funded project, uh, which um, will run over the following three years from now. And um, 
we are in the midst of planning and preparing for the next iteration, which is the day which please feel free to ask more about later. later. So I don't really need to spend much time in the slide. Um, at this meeting in particular, I'm sure we are all convinced that accurate localizations of FRBs are critical to delivering a range of interesting science outcomes, both on FRB progenitor science, as well as what we are particularly interested in, which is the effects of propagation along extragalactic site lines, um, looking at the total plasma contents in various environments. And what we're particularly interested in is also the um, uh, plasma and gravitational lensing of these events, as well as the magnetization of extragalactic plasma. And I encourage you to tune into talks by both um, Dana Samad and Liam Connor through the coming days on these topics. Now, the DSA itself, um, what, what, what follows is going to be a very instrumentation focused presentation. Um, so uh, please enjoy um, the uh, various uh, nitty gritty details of how we go about building such a telescope from the ground up. Um, the DSA is conceptualized as an array to localize more than 100 FRBs per year to better than three arc seconds um, in diameter, three arc second diameter localization regions. We've also committed to providing community alerts of these localization regions within 60 seconds, as well as a fully public data archive. Um, here are some of the DSA antennas um, in the midst of winter at our observatory. The idea is that we have a coherently combined core of 95 antennas, uh, which we use for searching. And these trigger the dumping of uh, voltages from the full complement of antennas including these outrigger antennas spread over two and a half kilometers across the site. And in post-processing of these voltages, we deliver localizations in a standard imaging way. So just to end, um, with the DSA 64 itself, the 64 element deployment that we're beginning commissioning off next week, um, we're simply forming fan beams, 256 beams um, using an east-west array, and the idea is that as the sky drifts overhead, sources drift through, um, like this uh, BO329 plus 54 pulsar drifting through the beams over here, or uh, continuum sources transiting through beams. Um, and this is what we use as our trigger to record voltages. The end-to-end -end pipeline is currently in a stage where uh, we are um, somewhat confident that if we see an FRB, we will be able to localize it, but that is the purpose of the commissioning period to come. So the antennas themselves, um, they're kind of, they're sort of an evolution of what we did for DSA 10 in that we now have um, elevation only drives that we design and build on site. Um, these are 4.65 4 meter antennas, spin formed aluminum reflectors, and a measured uh, net pointing error of about 0.14 degrees. This is particularly important for um, detections close to the edge of the primary beam and maintaining sensitivity over there. And the unit cost of each antenna, including labor, ends up being about $7,000. Um, here's a little uh, time lapse of one of the antennas putting, being put together um, uh, some months ago. Uh, um, Corey and Tommy over here take about, uh, I want to say just under a day to go from a box to a reflector. Um, you can see them here sort of happily tightening away the, at the bolts. I'm going to skip forward a little bit um, to where we actually use our extremely sophisticated template to um, confirm the parabolic shape. Um, we keep going with this um, and eventually you will see Corey kind of add the feed legs. Um, the feed legs themselves are actually transparent. Um, we chose a specific type of fiberglass that has the least um, um, reflections for radio waves. And um, we then, um, after putting it all together, load it onto this custom transport trailer and take it out to the um, array. Um, the receivers are really our, uh, are one of our pride and joys. Um, Sandy Weinreb and his group have designed these uh, room temperature LNAs that deliver um, less than seven Kelvin noise um, in real operating conditions. 
These are coupled to a custom um, uh, choke ring feed, um, which has a six inch waveguide at the back of it. Um, these things at the front are literally fans from a company called Fat Daddios, um, as some people have seen on various Food Network shows. Um, and uh, the, these feeds um, together with the dish surface yield an aperture efficiency that is somewhat um, over 65% at Zenith. Um, our measured T-CIS, um, as you will see later, ends up being something like 25 Kelvin um, on sky. Um, the infrastructure that um, um, infrastructure work led by Morgan Cather on site um, needs to serve each antenna with two single mode fibers as well as power. Um, so we have internet at each antenna as well as RF over fiber transmission of the RF signals. Um, you can see here we have we, we have our own um, trenching equipment that allows us to um, dig into the into the sand over there. Um, I'll emphasize that we also um, make use and employ. Uh, tribal monitors for the local um, Paiute uh, tribe in Big Pine, California, to um, make sure that if um, we were to dig up any artifacts, they are dealt with appropriately. Um, we then, uh, having um, dug, dug the uh, trenches, um, the outrigger antennas um, have these little drinks cooler boxes uh, for the pool boxes, um, which feed the antennas. The antenna boxes themselves contain various kinds of electronics, including uh, a lab jack uh, plus custom interface board for monitor and control. These are all, of course, uh, remotely steerable. The fibers themselves are terminated in a breakout rack in a central building. And um, Corey and, uh, and Tommy, not pictured here, um, spend about two months sitting in this enclosed room um, in the basement, splicing fiber. Um, all 486 fibers were terminated over that time. Um, it's currently... Uh, over 40 degrees C uh, every day at Owens Valley and the trenching, um, although the DSA trenching is complete, um, trenching is underway for the Owens Valley long wavelength array. Um, and so we take um, many breaks as needed. Um, Roxy pictured here, this is, this is her break time. Um, in terms to continue the infrastructure um, theme, um, we also developed a custom monitoring control system based on a distributed key value store called XCD. And the idea here is that it's a central store that is shared among all um, uh, services that service the various hardware elements. And XCD acts as both a control system, so such that if you update a key, everything can see the update as well as a monitor system such that things can update keys and snapshots of the etcd database are used to feed an influx uh, monitor database. And so we find that the system is quite performant and very easy to scale to the full um, uh, complement of hardware components. Um, we use this to control the antennas. Um, we use ingest weather information. We use this to control the digital backend. We even use it to trigger voltage dumps for FRBs. Um, everything is controlled by the central etcd server um, and we and we find this to be quite a um, quite a useful solution um, and the and the way that um, it's able to very easily connect things like influx and grafana for visualization um, really we find that incredibly helpful as well so i strongly recommend that anyone looking to find such a solution explores explores this um, the digital backend itself um, is um, complete and um, installed. And uh, Mark Hodges spent um, something like four months of the pandemic uh, installing and building this uh, system by, by himself in, in um, one of the buildings on site. Um, everything, including um, the sort of meat locker curtains um, to the fiber trays, to um, installing all these boxes, to actually carting every single um, server down and um, putting it in its place, uh, the lot. Um, in terms of uh, the hardware, we make use of 40 of these uh, SNAP-1 boards developed by NRAO in the Casper collaboration. Um, these uh, make use of 8-bit ADCs and implement a PFB and requantization stage. These boards then feed uh, the servers over these um, 40 gigabit Ethernet switches. And then we have 16 capture servers that capture the data. Um, we do a full N-squared cross-correlation as well as beamforming. 
and then implement a second stage corner turn to feed the um, search servers, which then perform the FRB searching and triggering as well. Um, in terms of performance, um, I'm not going to say very much at all at this stage, except that our preliminary performance measurements are that we are beating spec by at least um, a few tens of percent. Our um, specification for the per antenna system equivalent flux density was about 10,200 Jansky. And as measured in this plot here, which shows the SEFD versus frequency for the first complement of, uh, I think this is the first 10 antennas, um, we find that we are well below that 10,200 Jansky number. Um, and as I said before, our typical TSIS is about 25 Kelvin with an aperture efficiency of about 0.65. We're also being very careful to um, develop ways to characterize the phase errors within the primary beam in order to be confident in our localization and ability to calibrate using sources that are separated within the primary beam. Um, so far, we find that our phase errors are relatively good um, in that they're within about two degrees across the full um, half power beam width and phases from calibrated to calibrated are typically within plus or minus five degrees. Um, and so this work has largely been led by Dana Simard and Bada Uzgul, postdocs here at um, Caltech. And I should also give a particular mention to Dana as well for having led and continuing to lead the overall commissioning effort of, of the DSA. Um, in terms of software, um, we have a very high level of code reuse um, and an emphasis on trying to use portable data formats. Um, I've listed some of the many packages that we use within the DSA, and so I also want to um, extend a thank you to those who um, contributed their development. Um, some of the new developments that we have um, implemented include um, things like multi-threaded packet capture, um, a tensor core implementation of the beamformer, um, our um, second stage corner turn, which we built into PSR data, as well as RFI flagging work led by uh, Greg Helborg and I've listed the, the core software team up here. Um, in terms of post real-time processing or quasi real-time, um, there's um, various stages of candidate clustering, vetting and localization, calibration and system health pipelines. Um, and this is um, a, certainly an ongoing effort that will be commissioned over the coming months. And so just to finish up, uh, I want to reiterate that uh, this represents a final report on the DSA 110 construction. Um, we had one antenna at this time last year, and we we're about a week away from beginning a six month commissioning period of the 64 element deployment. Um, and the full DSA 110 is expected to be completed in early 2022. And I will leave you with this video of um, what the site looks like as of now. So I was hoping to show a webcam, but then unfortunately the link's a bit slow, um, but this is representative enough. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Vikram. Um, all right, there's a question from Chris Phillips. It says, is the code for the tensor core beamformer publicly available? If so, can you post the link? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, DSA 110 on GitHub. Absolutely. And I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to send you more details if, if you'd like. Great. Um, Matthew Bell says, how many kilowatts is the system? <laughs> That's a great question. We haven't actually measured it in, um, in, in, in anger, I suppose, but um, the typical uh, power usage per server is at about um, 500 to 600 watts, and we have uh, 24 servers running. Um, that's the main uh, power draw. The antennas themselves are draw next to nothing uh, in, in normal usage because the motors are typically off. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, we have the capacity, we have air conditioning capacity for about uh, 30 kilowatts. Uh, so it's a bunch of things coming in. Great, because we have lots of time for questions. Um, Keith, comment, which I, I second one of his comments. I wish I had your SEFD problems. Also, what's the extra stuff on the DSA 2000 antennas? I think he means that shielding, which I was curious about too. Yeah, so let me, um, let me uh, revert in 
to that to that um here we go so right so this is um uh i, I didn't really include any backup uh dsa 2000 slides and so i'm happy to provide more details offline but um the uh, idea is that we want two levels of shielding um there's a there's one one um part of the sort of the the, the purely cylindrical part is intended to as partly strength um, and also to stop uh, crosstalk between antennas. And then the second part, which is more sort of uh, not really a reflector, it's more of a ground shield. So we've actually got it, it looks like it's actually a two stage, uh, it looks like a two part thing, but they have two separate uh, um, requirements. Excellent. Um, there's a question by Adam Deller Why is the coherent core of 95 antennas laid out as a T? rather than one contiguous block, either one line or a rectangle? How is the Northern Spur added into the fan beams, if at all? Yeah, great question. So um, the T is entirely for historical purposes. Um, this was the site of the Ovro millimeter array, um, which had this beautiful uh, coplanar uh, T-shaped concrete infrastructure with um, trenches already dug. And so, um, I guess, as you can sort of see in the final slide, which I'll go back to, um, you can see the 10 meter antennas um, still on the T. You can see sort of the concrete over here. Um, yeah, that's the main reason uh, for that. In terms of how we actually combine it, um, we're um, planning to go ahead without fan beams altogether and move to an image plane search. All right. Um... Still lots of questions rolling in. So can DSA-64 and later the DSA-110 be used in combination with the EOVSA for FOB localization? I believe the latter also covers the L-band. That was from someone named Hari. Yeah, great question, actually. So I'm going to fall, fast forward a little bit to show you one of the EOVSA antennas. Here we go. That's good enough. Um, so this is one of the EOVSA antennas. Um, it's about uh, one and a half meters across. Uh, and so the answer is no. It's a short answer. Um, there's one caveat to that, which we haven't fully explored yet, which is I'm going to try and zoom to the right uh, location. Here we go. That's good enough. Um, so this antenna over here, which is a 27 meter dish um, built by built by John Bolton um, prior to him returning to Australia, uh, um, that is also part of EOVSA. Um, EOVSA is, of course, the Owens Valley uh, solar array used for sun imaging. Um, we could imagine a scenario where this 27 meter antenna is folded in. Um, it's only used for about two hours a day, but we haven't explored that yet. Great. Um, what is the DA, DSA 2000 budget? <laughs> you can answer live, but... Uh... Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, man, who, who asked that? Just so I have oh, an idea. Um, Timothy, sorry. Timothy Bateman. Oh, great. Hi, Tim. Um, yeah, so the um, the total budget is, um, I don't have the slide with the breakdown here, but I think I might have included it in a talk I gave the ATNF. Um, the total budget is of order 100 million, a little bit over, um, including, um, uh, including some years of operation, if I remember correctly. Right. Um... I'm going to pick, I think, one more question. Um, this is from Jason Hessels. Can you give us a feeling for how large the phase variations would need to be across the primary beams to have a significant influence on localization accuracy in your case? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, uh, as, as um, some may remember with the DSA-10 um, localization, um, we struggled a little bit with the, um, with the fact that we actually had what we thought were significant phase variations across the beam. Um, these were of order um, 15 degrees from half power point to half power point. Uh, and this actually necessitated, uh, because, because we simply did not have time to characterize them in detail, this necessitated calibration using source at the same location within the primary beam as where any detection was made. Um, and so I would say 15 degrees is extremely significant and needs to be carefully characterized. Um, much less than that is, of course, preferable. Um, 
we, we need to, we haven't fully uh, characterized um, exactly how all the errors propagate um, within the um, array, because of course, some antennas are more important than others if they're more on more extended baselines, for example. But um, that is definitely work we need to do over the coming, over the coming months. All right, I'm going to move on to the next talk. Thanks so much, Vikram. Thanks. Um, there's a couple more, more questions. I will um, send them over to the Slack. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Shidhu Zagarwal. I'm a final year PhD student at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at West Virginia University. And I'll be talking about comprehensive search and analysis tools for FRBs. So any FRB pipeline can be divided into these three steps. First is the data taking step. Second is the search, which we perform on that data to search for FRBs. And third is the analysis, which we do on the FRBs detected in that data. So in this talk, I'll be discussing some of the search and analysis tools which we have developed uh, for FRBs. So in search tools, I'll be talking about Yorian Pi Reader, Fetch, and Clustering Analysis. While for analysis tools, I'll be talking about Bershvit, FRBPA, and Banded Incompleteness. And in the end, I'll give an example of a project in which we used all of these tools so let's write, uh, dive right in. Starting from Unified Reader, Unified Reader or YOR is a Python framework to read, write, and process data without worrying about the data format. It's purely written in Python and consists of many functions and classes for most single search analysis. It has been very extensively documented and have been very rigorously tested. Currently, it is, uh, you can use YOR to read and write filter bank and PSR fits files or convert from one data format to the other. You can also use it to write a PSR data. Here is a link to the GitHub repository, and I definitely recommend you to check it out. Now let's talk about some of the tools which are present in Unified Reader. Starting from your viewer, which can be used to visualize the data. As you can see on the screenshot here on the right, uh, you can see the spectrogram of the data. The data, the red here is from 0.36 to 0.90 seconds. You can change the range of the data you want to read. You can even de-disperse the data if you want, if you know the DM and just see whether the pulse appears in this top frequency average time series. You also see this time average band pass and one standard deviation. Some, uh, some other statistics of the data are also data read on visualized are also shown in the logging. You can even visualize RFI flagging and some other uh, things using your viewer. Next up is RFI filtering uh, using your RFI mask. So in, in your we have implemented two, two RFI filtering algorithms, SAF goal filter and spectrocatosis filter. Uh, you can either use both of those or you can use either one of those with any of their input uh, by changing any of their input parameters. Your RFI mask can be used to visualize how, the, uh, how this, these algorithms are influencing your data or which channels are being masked. So as you can see, these red points show uh, the channels that have been masked, masked are also shown, also shown as these red points on this band class. Uh, and you can change these parameters and see what the data looks like. It can also provide you with a channel mask that you can then feed in your search system. Next is your writer, which can be used to convert from one data format to the other or just process the data. Uh, so here I'm giving you a simple example uh, wherein we are reading in a fixed file called 20n.fits, reading it into your, uh, then passing that into the writer object and just by using these four lines of code, we can either uh, write it out as a fill file or as a filter bank file. Now you can also see that uh, it's, it's possible to change all of these different uh, properties of the data or just choose a certain chunk of data. You can select a range of spectra. You can select the range of channels you want to write. You can even do RFI flagging or zeodium subtraction uh, along with the data conversion from one format to the other. And finally, uh, your can also be used to convert. Your, your can also be used to do an end-to-end -end, uh, FRB search from uh, using your Heimdall. So this utility runs Heimdall on filter bank or fits files. So uh, this is because it's the data is read in your, which is then passed onto data buffers on which the Heimdall is run. You can do on the fly RFI mitigation, custom channel mask, do some banded search, and all sorts of functionalities which are possible with the your framework. And obviously, you can set any of your typical or Heimdall parameters from this your Heimdall utility. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to point out is that your can, it's very easy to include other data formats in your, uh, and all of these common utilities would still work, uh, can still work with that. And I'll be really happy if anyone is interested to do that. 
Now let's say you did a search on some data and found FRBs. And now you want to classify those FRBs. For that, we have Fetch, which is a set of deep learning models for FRB classification. Uh, it has been designed to be telescope and frequency agnostic to a gratefully designed strategy of training and pre-processing. Fetch has, in the past two years, Fetch has been used to detect uh, FR, uh, bursts from many repeaters and a non-repeater. Here are just some examples. It's been used to detect 18016, um, galactic FRB, burst from 1102, uh, from 17, 10, 19, 19, 11, and it has also been used to detect a non repeater 19, 14, and many more. Uh, next, let's talk about clustering analysis. So any single post search pipeline uh, searches for bus using many trial DMs and many trial width values. So any event can trigger at multiple values of DM and uh, trial search space. Here I'm just showing a simple example using real fast configuration. Real fast configuration is special because it also searches on the image plane. So it also, it also gives us a position of the candidate because it does real-time localization. So the x-axis here shows signal to noise of the injected transient. The y-axis just shows the number of trials at which the, that single event triggered or the number of candidates it generated. Uh, and the idea is that for a single app candidate, we, get, we can get a lot of candidates. Single event, we can get a lot of candidates and we want to cluster all of them together. So you can see any of these can uh, give tens to hundreds of candidates, which can overwhelm our post-processing system. Here I'm visualizing uh, just six injective transients and candidates generated from those. The left is a real time sky a relative sky position, right is DM and time. And we want to cluster all of these candidates into these six different uh, clusters together. To do that, we developed our, uh, a robust clustering analysis wherein we compared these eight different algorithms using a custom metric called score. This score made sure that all of the, the FRB candidates are clustered into a single cluster without much impurity from RFI candidates. It also made sure that all of the FRB and RFI clusters formed were so well separated and no FRB was missed due to incorrect, uh, incorrect clustering. Here we can see the clustering performance using all of the four features, uh, which is DM time and sky position in black, using just sky position in red, and using DM and time in blue. And we can see that sky, using sky position definitely improves the clustering performance uh, over just using DM and time. This can also be visualized on this plot on the left, where we trained a random forest classifier to classify FRBs from RFI using our same data set. And it clearly says, uh, shows that a sky position features are much more important given by this important score uh, than DM time in classifying FRB candidates from RFI candidates. So after we have a search for these, uh, search for these FRBs, we want to extract the properties out of them. For that, let's talk about some uh, uh, analysis tools. First up is BurstFit, which is a Python framework to do spectrotemporal modeling of FRBs. An interesting thing about BurstFit is that you can give any user-defined function to model the profile spectra and spectrogram. So we do have some functions uh, in built in BurstFit to model these. For example, a Gaussian or a Gaussian convolved with exponential for profile, uh, a Gaussian or um, got multiple Gaussians for spectra, and so on. But if you have any other model you want to try, you can just give it as a Python function and BurstFit framework can take care of it during fitting. It starts with uh, using curve uh, SciPy's curve fit to get an initial estimate of the parameters, but then it uses a whole full-scale MCMC using the likelihood to get the posteriors of all the parameters. On the right, uh, I'm showing just a sample result of a burst of burst fit on this 12 node burst, which showed three components. This top right plot shows the three component model from burst fit and the bottom panels just show the time series profile of, in the two cases. This is the link of uh, the GitHub link of burst fit and I recommend you to check this is just another example of uh, two 121102 bursts, B93 and B67, which we recently published in this paper. The first column just shows the, the original data. Second column shows the model which we obtained from the fitted parameters, the best fit parameters of first fit. And then the third column shows the residual. And as we can see, the residual, uh, which was generated by subtracting model from the original data, looks like noise. And we also perform statistical tests to make sure that the on pulse residual looks actually like off pulse noise. And because we did a full-scale MCMC, you do get posterior distribution of all the parameters and the correlations between different parameters. So this is just an example for B67. Next is FRBP8, which is FRB periodicity analysis. So as we know, there have been two repeaters, uh, 121102 and 18016, which have shown activity in their periodicity in their burst activity. 
So FRBPA consists of three FRB search methods that can be used, three, three uh, periodicity search methods that can be used to search for periodic activity uh, in their burst MJDs. It can also be used to visualize the periodic activity as can be seen on this plot on the left. And here's the link of the GitHub repository for FRBPA. Now let's talk, uh, let's spend some time to talk about band completeness. For a, a best way to estimate the completeness of any single pool search pipeline is to do injection analysis, wherein we inject a lot of transients at different uh, properties and see what percentage of the transients are recovered for, let's say, a given range of PMs, let's say, given range of uh, bits, or, and so on, to estimate the selection function or estimate the properties, uh, rec the recovered properties of the transients and what fractions are we missing. In this, in the next coming few slides, I talk about how banded nature of bursts can cause an observation bias. And as we have seen, many of these repeaters which we are detecting have banded emission, which can be well modeled using a Gaussian function. So the idea is that we are not sensitive to weak bursts that primarily lie outside our observing band. Let's take a closer look. So let's say uh, the red shaded region here represents our observing band. And I'm representing all of these different curves. And let's say all of these different curves are different spectra uh, modeled using a Gaussian function. The parameters of these individual Gaussians are also drawn from a normal distribution. And the energies of these different bursts are also are drawn from power law distribution. I run a search, single pulse search on it with a constant fluence threshold. And I detect uh, these blue curves. So you can see all of these, most of these curves lie within our observational band, which makes sense. We'll detect the burst which primarily lies within our band. So let's call all of these which are within our band in band bursts, but we still have some bursts which are not primarily within our band, but were still detected. Let's call them out of band bursts which were detected. Now, this green shows the bursts which were not detected. And as we can see, there are some bright ones which were mostly outside the band, which were also not detected. So the idea is that we are complete to the bursts which are primarily within our band, but we are incomplete to the sample of bursts which are fractionally within our band because we are not able to detect the weak sample here while we were able to detect the weak sample here. This leads to some observational biases, which we'll see. So yeah, the next problem here is estimating the fluence of these bursts. We typically use signal to noise to estimate the fluence, but this will underestimate, uh, this will, uh, underestimate the intrinsic fluence value. This is because, again, taking the same example of the detected burst, let's look at four such bursts. Uh, here we can see that these, for these three bursts, 92, 99, and 98% of the fluence or the energy is within our band. So if we estimate their fluences using signal to noise, we'll get a pretty close value to the intrinsic value. But for this one, most of the energy is outside the band and we'll get a very underestimated fluence. Moreover, if we use the burst bandwidth as the signal seen in this, then we are definitely using an incorrect value because the correct value of the bandwidth is something very different. To solve this problem, we can fit a Gaussian model of spectra uh, and estimate the intrinsic fluence and bandwidth of the bursts. Let's see how that influences our energy distributions. So again, the same example, we run a search. This red curve shows the intrinsic distribution given by power law. And then the green curve here shows the SNR derived energies. And we are generated the power law of that. And we clearly see that there is a corner in this distribution, we probably need a two break power law model to fit it and get the actual intrinsic distribution. Uh, the legend here shows the slopes of these uh, slopes of the fitted, fitted slopes on this green curve. And this corner here is just due to this band incompleteness because we are estimating, we are missing the bursts which are primarily outside our band. And also we are estimating the fluences using signal to noise, which is not the correct way. Uh, which is not which is underestimating the fluence values. If we instead use fitted fluences, we still do not get the correct values because we are still missing out on all the bursts which are outside our band. But if we use only the bursts which are primarily within our band and we are complete to that sample, we get the cyan curve on which if we fit a power law, then we get the slope which is very close to the intrinsic slope of minus 1.5. If our fluence threshold is worse, then this this red uh, then this green curve looks even worse because it shows a turnover, a smooth turnover. But again, the fit in band burst give us a correct slope. So this paper is in prep and it will be submitted to archive uh, sometime this week. So do keep an eye out for that. Finally, I want to very quickly discuss uh, this project uh, for FR1102, wherein we had three hours of receivable observations and we detected 133 bursts using your Heimdall and Fetch. We also used all the other tools I have described in this, uh, in this 
uh, in this talk so far. So far, BPA burst fit and banning completeness. Here are just six screenshots, uh, screen uh, snapshots of those bursts. Uh, we did the typical repeater analysis, so burst rate analysis, wait time analysis, wherein we found that using large number of bursts, we found the burst rate, uh, we found the wait time consistent with the other published results of around 70 seconds and a smaller peak here. This is fitted by a long normal distribution. We did a periodicity search, but we did not detect any period, a short term, short term period. Using the cumulative energy distribution, we only draw, made the distribution of the bursts which are primarily within our band, which also showed, which again showed a break. Uh, as we can see here in the gray, uh, fitted by a broken power law model. We believe that it is due to our incompleteness analysis. We were not able to do rigorous injection analysis because we only had two observations of three hours, uh, of one and a half hour each. But uh, this higher energy power law slope was minus 1.8, which is similar to what the authors have seen uh, for 12.1.02. So this is my summary slide. Uh, just to summarize all the tools I've discussed in this talk, your can be used to search, visualize flag data, and convert from one format to the other, just processing uh, your data without worrying about the input data format. Fetch can be used to classify Farbees and RFI. Clustering uh, analysis, in which we developed a robust metric to compare different clustering algorithms, and using sky location improves the clustering performance. Burst fit can be used to model burst fit program and obtain posterior distributions of all the fitted parameters. Band incompleteness. It says that there's a bias due to the banded nature of repeaters, and we should correct for that while doing our energy estimations, should use in-band fluences, and we should also use banded uh, FRBs in our injection analysis. An FRBP that can be used to search for periodic activity in repeaters, and I recommend you to check out the Petawide Project GitHub repository uh, for the code for all of these different softwares I've discussed. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so there's a question in, okay, well, so there's a, a softball question from Casey Law. I appreciate you asking this question, Casey. He says, how great is your graduate student? And should people be offering him a job? He's great. <laughs> so yeah, Shadij is my graduate student. He's, he's looking for a job this year. Um, he'll probably be graduating at the end of the year and he's, he's a really great student. He, uh, you know, has generated all of the software and uh, is a, wonderful person to work with. Um, all right, so Jason has a, Hessels has a shit question, which is, have you guys thought about the bandedness issue in light of the fast claim of a turnover at low energies? Yes, so we have done some analysis. Um, we're, we're doing some work, you know, we, we can't fully model the fast um, pulses because we don't have all of the, you know, the we can't do burst modeling on them because we don't have their data. Um, but some of the shape of the fast results um, for 121102 can be described by the issues that Shitij is discussing um, in this talk. So Shitij will we'll actually be publishing a paper um, on the band and completeness work, and there will be a little bit of that discussion in that paper. So I, I think you should look forward to that, Jason. Um, that should be coming out soon, if, if not um, already. Right, um, I'm happy to take other questions for this talk. Give it a minute. Yeah, and and Jason, I think um, part of the issue is the way that they've just um, the way that they've defined um, their energy. They have assumed a fully banded burst, like a, a wide band burst, um, but then of course these are in fact banded so there, there's a little bit of issue of band incompleteness but also just in the way they've defined um, burst energy which is, is not necessarily a problem specific to that work i think a lot of people do this but the fact that bursts you know some bursts are banded um, requires us to be careful about the way that we construct pulse energy distributions um, can, so yeah since i can really uncovered some important stuff here but go ahead well i was just gonna say since i can unmute anyway it seems to me, though, that um, if you're well above the, so effectively what you have is that your completeness threshold is kind of different for every burst, right? I mean, it depends on what the band, um, bandwidth of that burst is, how well it's within the band or not. So there's kind of this gray region where the, where the completeness starts to turn over faster than you might think 
uh, it does, right? Um, yeah. Yep. All right, so we're a little bit past the hour. I appreciate you guys all staying around and I'm gonna call this session to a close. Thanks all for the, the great session. Tune in next time. <laughs>